So good morning. Um, so I'm going to make a, this is a joint work with uh, a lot of colleagues and Jonas Peters who is from uh, the Max Planck in Tübingen and I moved to ETH and my other colleagues from Microsoft. Oh, sorry, thank you very much. Uh, let me start with some background. And uh, a couple of years ago, I found uh, myself working with this uh, little ad star displayed on search pages. And it's a good example for a real life machine learning uh, system. And first, one should understand why it is difficult. So let's look what's there. You have advertisers, they create ads, they place bits, they give them to the search engine or the publisher. Users give queries, and the search engine is supposed to compose pages with the number of ads and certain prices for the clicks. And then the user may or may not click, causing the price to be paid by the advertiser to the publisher, and uh, you generate a lot of data. Now, if you change the algorithms that decide which ads are shown, you have a lot of consequences that are not so simple. Uh, there is a direct consequence that you change the ads that are shown, therefore you change the ads that can be clicked, therefore you change the data that's collected and used for the learning algorithms that define uh, how the system is working. But you also have a lot of other effects that are on a different time scale. Like, uh, if the ads are annoying, users won't be so willing to enter queries or click on ads. Uh, if the ratio between the price and the number of clicks they get is not good enough, advertisers will be unwilling to bid. And so what you have here is a system that's very complex because of all this feedback loop and multiple time frames. And it's not specific to ads, like if you do something like uh, recommendation systems, you have the same kind of problems. Uh, there is another feedback loop that is not on this graph, but that could be here, is that uh, Inside the, this organization, you have a lot of people, they're looking at the data and they try to do good. So they're going to change things in the system by moving some knobs or they're going to uh, interface with the advertisers and do something. And they also change the system. So the nature of the learning machine is interesting because it's not a computer, it's an organization. You have people, you have machines, you have uh, the way they interact together and in the end, it's not so much about algorithms, but about signals. You want to know what is the training signal that can inform both human and machines and do a better thing. And you have to find it in the masses of data that are generated by such a system. So what's happening with these feedback loops? The data is collected when the system operates in a certain way. And the data follows first distribution then you use this data to justify some actions that are going to change the operating point, first in the short term, and then it's going to change later when the various time uh, um, scales are going to enter, come into play. Therefore, the newly observed data follows a second distribution, and it's not clear that correlations you observe on the first distribution uh, exist in the second distribution. So you have this problem of the dog trying to chase its tail, and um, well, you have to deal with that. So, of course, there is a lot of work on this topic. There is work in auction theory and mechanism design. So, that, actually, this work motivates the design of ad auctions. And uh, it basically treats the advertiser feedback loop. What's going to happen if advertisers are not happy or too happy with the ratio between, uh, basically, price and clicks? But it also has weaknesses because it assumes that there is a single option instead of repeated auctions. And in fact, advertisers place bids that are valid for plenty of auctions. It assumes click probabilities are known rather than estimated. It ignores the impacts of ads on the future user engagement and ignores how advertisers place a single bid that's valid for multiple auctions. And so this is interesting, but it doesn't provide a clear way to describe the full system and its time frames. Uh, as auctions that can, be, I mean, that can be analyzed in this way. Now, there is work in the machine learning community about multi arm bandits and maybe more interestingly, contextual bandits. And this is about the learning feedback loop, how the data that I'm going to collect is going to bias my learning system in a different way. And uh, there are very interesting results about explore-exploit with uh, a relatively solid theory. 
But there is nothing about the impact of ads on future user engagement and nothing about the impact on future advertiser bids. So again, you have the problem that these results are nice, but they treat simplified systems, and you have no clear way to decompose the complete system into simple system that can be analyzed in this way. So in this work, I'm taking the causal inference viewpoint. I'm going to assume that changing the ad placement system is an intervention of the system, and I want to understand what are all the consequences and track all the consequences of this change. And my claim is that this is a better way to reason about such problems, that he gives a powerful and flexible experimentation methods, new learning algorithms, and in fact, uh, it's working quite well. So the first question is to know whether this is an overkill, because causation is a complicated topic. And uh, the, the dead ringer that uh, suggested to go this way is that you have pervasive causation paradoxes in ad data. And here is an example. So if you consider the event A, the first mainline ad, the one at the top, receives a high score. And event B, the second one receives a click. You observe a correlation, like placing a good top ad increases the clicks on the second ad. And this is what's expressed here. Basically, when the score on the first ad is high, you get more clicks on the second ad. Now, if you take a third event, which is the query is categorized as commercial, well, and you distribute this contingency table according to whether the third event is true or false, you completely reverse the conclusion. So what's happening here? is called the Simpson reversal, and the problem is that the, the event C is the count funding thing. It's a cause for both effects. So basically, when the query is very commercial, both ads tend to receive a lot of clicks, and when it's not, they don't. So the, causal, the causation con connection is not between A and B. It's from C to A and C to B. So the problem here is that here is nice because we can find what is the confounding factor. But in many cases, there are plenty of confounding factors we just don't know. So this means clearly that if you look at just correlation in your data, you can go completely crazy. You're not going to give, uh, to, to have a result that you can really trust. So of course, uh, this is one of the reasons why the gold standard for this kind of uh, techniques are randomized experiments called A-B testing. So basically, if you want to compare two ad placement systems, you randomly split the traffic or the user into buckets, you apply alternative placement algorithms to distinct buckets. You wait a couple of months, you collect statistics, and you see what's there. Uh, well, this is the gold standard, but it's not perfect. It's not perfect because it's hard to control for advertiser effects. Like, for instance, um, if you split your advertisers into buckets and you have a page that has ads from both advertisers, where are you going to count it? The second problem is that to do this, you need a full implementation and wait several weeks. So this is not very good if you just want to test an ID or see if something could be a good thing to develop. It's something that you can do at the end, not at the beginning. And the third one, which I think was the motivation, is that the progress speed is limited by the traffic you have. So if you're the little search engine with a lot less traffic than Google, well, you don't want to do that. That's not sufficient. So you need an alternative. And the alternative is difficult because you have all these causation paradoxes in the data and all these uh, confounding things. So to develop an alternative, you have to swallow the complexity of causation. And that also means that um, this is a situation in which probabilistic reasoning will be insufficient. You need to reason with causation. So let me first give a little idea about what is causation and why it's different. So in the data, you can observe correlations, and they're absolutely predictive. Like, for instance, if it is raining, then people probably carry, on, carry open umbrellas. There is a correlation between it's raining and open umbrellas. And if people carry open umbrellas, then it's probably raining. But if you start intervening to manipulating the system, for instance, if you ban umbrellas, it doesn't mean that the rain is going to stop. And you have, in fact, two kinds of interventions you can consider. The hypothetical one, will it rain if we ban umbrellas? And the counterfactual one, which is very bizarre, would have it rained if we had banned umbrellas? So you're asking a qu question about something that did not happen and cannot happen anymore. And that's going to be absolutely important. So when you say that something causes something, 
it's a tool for reasoning about the outcome of interventions. And uh, this uh, framework, there are a lot of recent advances in causal inference, that you have a work of statisticians like Rubin and then Spear Test, and you have the rec recently the, the work of Perl that was uh, very useful for this particular uh, work. So I'm going now to go a little bit on how Perl describes uh, uh, interventions and how this can be used in this case. So the first step is the structural equation model. So let's look at uh, a part of that system. So you say that there is a variable that the user intent, and the query is a function of the user intent and some noise variable. You don't know what it is. And you have an ad inventory. Okay. And then the ads you can, the ads that are uh, uh, eligible for this particular query are a function of the query and the inventory, and the same for the bits. Then you compute scores that depends on the ads and the query, and then you compute a set of ads to be displayed that depend on the bits, and you also compute prices. Then the user can decide to click or not, and the click and the prices give you the revenue. All this is completely deterministic except for the noise variables. The yellow thing here is what I know very well. It's the code. It's my system. The other parts, I don't know too well. And then you have variables that have no arrows incoming. And in fact, if you believe in Leibniz, uh, you're going to say that no event is without causes. So this uh, graph has to be seen in the context of a very large one. And uh, these events, like clicks and revenue, are going to affect other graphs, other parts of the graphs, and, and the user intent is caused by other things, and we don't necessarily know which ones. Now, when you intervene on the system, it's basically that you change something. You change something in your code, for instance. You change the scoring function. And when you change the scoring function, well, it's basically an algebraic manipulation of this system of equations. And you can do quite a lot of different algebraic manipulations, provided that they maintain the acyclic nature of the graph. You know, there is this time thing that is important for causation, of course. Now, the question, sorry. The question is, what do you do with all the functions you don't know in this graph? Like, uh, how the query depends on the user intent, how the clicks depend on the ad slate and the user intent and everything. And of course, you want to replace knowledge by statistics. And in the most essential form, statistics requires repeated experiments. So you need somehow to isolate experiments. And one simple way to do it, which actually cuts the feedback loop in this system, is to assume that these variables, user intent, ad inventory, follow a certain distribution that is supposed to be constant, not changing. So by saying this, we basically say that the outcome of one of these experiments cannot affect the other experiments. We assume they're isolated. I'm going to reintroduce the feedback loop later, but right now it's convenient to look at it this way. So once we have a distribution for the exogenous variable, we can interpret each of the equations as something that gives rise to a conditional distribution, and we get a factorization of the state of all the variables. And that's a base net, that's a typical base net of Perl. Now, when you have an intervention, you get a distribution on the intervention where one of these factors or one or several of these factors have been changed. So, if you remember the slide with the little dog where I explained that distributions change as a result of interventions, this is what's happening here. But they don't change in an absolutely random way. They change in ways that are quite well controlled that depend on the structure of the graph. So basically, you can, observing your first distribution and having an idea of what is the intervention, you might be able to anticipate what the distribution under intervention is going to be. So what you can see here is that depending on which intervention you do, you don't have one base network, but you have many base networks. And they're all related because they share some factors. And so what you can see is that this is a transfer learning on steroids. And I'm going to take an example of causal system that's very simple, it's physics. You have an experiment one where you try to measure the gravitation constant. And so the only factor that you really care about is the one that has the parameter, which is the gravitation constant. You have an experiment number two where going to, you weigh a, a rock. In experiment three, you're going to throw the rock and you want to know where it goes. 
So things that you learn on these two experiments are going to be useful to predict the outcome of the third one. And this is the same thing at work. It's very close to physics. So now I want to measure something that did not happen. I want to, my, my basic question is this. How would have my system, my ad placement system performed if when the data was collected, we had used, let's say, scoring model M prime instead of scoring model M? It cannot happen anymore. It's too late. But if I'm able to measure this, then I can collect data that describes the operation of the system during a past time period. I can find change that would have increased the performance of the system if they had been applied during the data collection period and infer that maybe they're going to be valid in the future, implement, verify, and do the A-B testing and everything. So my key here is I want to measure something that did not happen. But it turns out that in many cases it's quite easy. Like, let's take a simple case where you want to uh, do simple classification, like you collect uh, images of characters, you scan them, you have a, somebody label them, then you have a recognition system, and then a judgment that decides whether your recognition is good or not. Now, if you want to know what would have happened if you had used a different classifier, it's very easy. You just have to replay the data, and you can do it because you know everything here. You know which new system you want to test, and you know how to compare the labels with the outcome of the output of the system. Well, in something like the ad placement system, it's not so simple because, uh, okay, you can replace a scoring model, then you get different ads, and because of the, the different pages, you don't know how the users would have reacted. You don't know what they click. So you cannot really do that. You, you, you. But you can use simple methods that are basically important sampling. So, Remember, we have a distribution under intervention that I note with a little star, which is basically the distribution we observe with one factor changed. And suppose we want to measure a click rate, for instance. The click rate that we measure in our system is an expectation of click with respect to the distribution of all my data. Now, I would like to have the click rate as an expectation of my clicks under a different distribution, the one that occurs as a consequence of the intervention that didn't happen. But I can do it by simply uh, dividing and multiplying by P and reinterpreting this expectation as an expectation with respect to the original distribution. So I get reweighted uh, expectations. I get weights. So the principle here is to rewrite the past examples to emulate the probability they would have had under the counterfactual distribution. And because these two distributions have a lot of factors in common, their ratio simplifies, and I'm just, less, I'm just left with the factors that are actually different. So I don't need to know too much. I need to know what was before, and I need to know what I want to put in my system at this place. It also means that I, I don't want to have a zero below here. It means that I have to have explicit randomization in my system, and this is consistent with everything we know about causation. You need randomized experiment, but you can do it in a very flexible manner, and you don't need that much. Now, you have a problem, which is the quality of the estimation. If the actual and the counterfactual distribution overlap, well, it's fine, you have a good coverage, your ratios are going to be reasonable, but if they don't overlap, in this area here, you're going to divide the normal number by something very close to zero. You're going to have very large ratios, and your average, your weighted average is going to be dominated by just a few examples because they have low probability, but with such a large value that they're going to swamp everything in noise. So we need somehow to have confidence intervals, and they're going to reveal more things than just uh, the statistical significance. They're also going to reveal whether there is sufficient overlap between my distribution to give an answer. So basically whether my actual distribution performs sufficient exploration to answer the question of interest. So to do confidence intervals, I could try to use the central limit theorems, but my ratios here can be very large and basically a few samples in poorly explored regions dominate the sum and the solution is just to ignore them. So here is how you can do it. You have a well-explored area. is the part where the ratio is less than a certain quantity R. We can choose it a priori. My, my trick is to choose the fifth largest one that I observe in my data, but fine. And of course, 
On that domain, the estimate is quite good because the, the ratios are bounded and you can apply the usual tricks to do confidence intervals. Now, the problem is to bound what happens in the rest of the space. And the thing is that in the rest of the space, if I say for that the quantity uh, I want to integrate is bounded, I can say that it's bounded by uh, that the, what's happening in the rest of the space is bounded by its value times one minus the probability of the space I know under the star distribution. And the probability of the space I know under the star distribution is easy to estimate because I can express it in terms of just the bounded ratios. So I can also estimate this value with a reasonable thing. So this is all a little bit complicated, but it's interesting in the end because I get a confidence interval that has two parts. There's one part that I call the outer interval. It's just the, 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 the statistical confidence interval on the regions of the space that are well explored. And basically, this is just a statistical thing. If this is too large, I just need to sample more. I'm going to have more data. I'm going to make it smaller. And the second part is the part that bounds what's happening in the regions I don't understand very well. And this is too large. It means that there is no point to getting more data. What I need to do is redesign my experiment, get more randomization, because I need to explore this area. The problem I have is not that I don't have enough data, it's that I don't explore it too well. So it's nice to have confidence intervals like this because they not only give me a confidence, they give me a prescription to improve the situation if the, uh, the value is not satisfactory. So let me just give an illustration in a very simple case. So the simplest case I can think of is that you have ads that show here on top of the other ones and ads on the side. And what distinguishes them is just a threshold on the score. And the question I'm going to ask is, what would have happened when the data was collected if that threshold had been set differently? So, so my threshold is called the mainline reserve. Well, that's the name we give it. And uh, uh, I'm going to collect data by applying a random log normal multiplier to this threshold, something that roughly divided by two multiplied by two 95% uh, of the time. And uh, in that case, I had 22 million auctions over five weeks. And I'm a bunch of control buckets that I'm going to describe later. And here is the kind of graphs I get. Uh, at, on the x-axis, you have the variation of this threshold. And 0% is indeed the system I had when data was measured. The blue area is the inner interval. And what you see that when I go too far away, it explodes, meaning that I haven't explored what's happening there. I cannot really say anything. The little bar here is the outer interval. I have enough data to be quite good in that respect. Now, when I look what's happening here, for instance, here this means uh, this is my estimation of what would have happened if I had increased my threshold by, uh, let's say, 20%. But what I did is that when I collected the data, I had another bucket where I actually used the different mainline reserve and it was 18% lower, it was here. So basically, I'm able to predict it pretty well. I also had another control where I had no randomization at all. And it's finally very close to the, the original one, meaning that it's not that expensive to do these kind of things. And the reason is that, well, you're not really optimal, so sometimes a little bit better, sometimes a little bit worse. As long as you're far from the optimal regime, it's not going to be too bad. And of course, you can measure other things like the average number of mainline ads per page, which is something that you could compute directly, so it's good to validate. Or things like the revenue, which is a bit different, where you see that this time is the outer interval that's large. And the reason is that a small fraction of the ads generate a lot more revenue. So, so if you just look at these, because they're, the, they're a good part of the revenue, you realize that you have actually less data relative to to what you want to, to, to the click rate. Now, so far, so good. But the interesting part is that I can use exactly the same data to answer a lot of other questions. And this data is very simple. It's just randomizing my threshold. But I can get estimates for different randomization variants. 
It's just another distribution in my ratio, so I can try to predict what would happen if I used more or less randomization, and, uh, be, and basically, uh, so I can know how much it would cost me to use more randomization and more exploration. Uh, I can do reserves that depend on the query, which is just another counterfactual distribution. So this is the big advantage. I collect data first, and I choose my questions later. And my confidence intervals tell me whether I can actually answer the question with that data, and what should I do if I cannot. And the more things are randomized, the more opportunities I have to answer these kind of questions. And the new challenge now is to make sure that I do not leave information on the table. And for this, you can have a quite uh, rich toolbox of methods. So maybe the most interesting one is that there are very uh, efficient way to leverage the structure of the graph to get better confidence intervals. Like for instance, uh, it's known that users click without knowing the scores or knowing the click prices because they don't see them. They're not on the page. You know, the scores are not displayed near the ads and the prices are not displayed there. And you can do it by basically shifting the point of reweighting. So instead of waiting at the level of the scores, where you have this ratio, the one I just explained, you can wait at the level of the page by looking at a slightly different way to factor the distributions. And when you do this, you go from something like this to something like this. So basically, you improve the inner interval. This is equivalent to exploring more, which is quite nice. Uh, to give an idea, uh, basically, this point here is something I predict at 0.01% uh, accuracy. So that was a new thing at the time to, to be able to characterize the working, uh, how the system works with this kind of accuracy. There are other things I can do, which is uh, to compare two potential interventions. Is the scoring model M1 better than the scoring model M2, which is the difference of two counterfactual click-through rates? And when I do this, I have opportunities for variance reduction. For instance, I know that seasonal variations affect both models in nearly the same way. So by using an appropriate predictor, I can eliminate this part of the variance and uh, get much more narrow confidence intervals. And if you continue this logic, you find a new viewpoint on the thing called doubly robust estimation in, in biostatistics. If you can have differences, you can have derivatives. And this is a view at the policy gradient in reinforcement learning. This is very close to policy gradient, except that in reinforcement learning, you have a specific causal graph, which is this, uh, this, this um, partially observable Markov model. Now, uh, if I have derivatives, I can start optimizing. For instance, there is one thing that's interesting is that uh, in many cases, you rank ads by uh, decreasing order of bit times an estimate of the click probability or a score to a certain power alpha. And uh, Sebastian Lae and Preston McAfee showed that using an alpha less than one is good when the click probability estimation is not very reliable because the idea is that when you don't know whether the ads is going to be clicked or not, you can try to trust the advertiser. If, if they plus a high bid, maybe they know what they're doing. Now, of course, you could use different alpha and different results for each query cluster, and you can try to estimate the counterfactual, and you can get level curves like this, where depending on the mainline reserve multiplier and the alpha, you can get the variations of the number of mainline ads, variations of the estimated that has a value, click rate, and everything, and then you can optimize or use whatever is your preferred multi-criterion optimization to find the point you, you want to be in. So it's quite nice to be able to compute these things. Now, if I look at learning as a counterfactual optimization problem, I have a number of questions to ask. Does it generalize? If I do something like this in the past, is it working in the future? And the answer is, if I assume my isolation assumption is true, which is not always true, uh, I can obtain uniform, convergence and, uh, uniform confidence intervals, and I can apply, I can apply a Vapnik-like theory. Uh, sequential design is, well, can I do a sequential system so I randomize it in a certain way, then I move my system in a better way, I randomize again, and so on? Yes, of course. And this is connected to Thomson sampling, except that it's viewed in a, in a much broader context. Uh, can I decide how much exploration I need to use? Well, my confidence intervals, they tell me what to do. 
Now, it's difficult to really know uh, how much exploration you would like to have, but you can look at the problem in the other way. You can say, well, I have that much traffic on I can explore on, and my goal is to make sure that whatever exploration I do is used properly, that I don't leave a bit of information on the table. And this is why I'm working very hard on all these confidence intervals. Now, I have to go back to my feedback loops, because so far I've made this isolation assumption, which basically cuts the feedback loops in a way uh, that's a bit brutal, and I want them back. So here is an example of what's happening. Uh, I'm going to assume that my system goes to some equilibrium, it goes to some stable state, and this is a simplifying assumption. And for instance, if I increase the threshold on the relevance of ads, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to show less ads and I'm going to lose revenue in the short term. Then users are going to see more relevant ads, and uh, maybe they're going to be more likely to click on ads in the future, possibly making up for the revenue I've lost, but maybe not. And for advertisers, it's even more complicated because they will eventually update their bids, and it could go both ways, because at the same time, they get less click because less ads are shown, but the users are more interested, so these clicks could be more valuable. And it's not obvious a priori what's going to happen. So my question, my counterfactual question, is now becoming quite complex. It's something like this. What would have been the system performance metric if we had applied a very small change of the parameter of the scoring model long enough to reach the equilibrium during the data collection period? And the way to answer this kind of question is to use a trick of physics called quasi-static analysis. Basically, I'm going to suppose that I move my system very slowly. Under adequate condition, I can show there is only one equilibrium. So if I move my system very slowly, my theta very slowly, I can try to see what's happening if I assume that the system stays at equilibrium all the time and characterize the derivatives of this, do a linear response uh, model. Now, if I move brutally, well, because there is just one equilibrium, it's going to go there, so I can follow the trajectory of the equilibrium. And the way to proceed is to augment my graph by a couple parameters. So I have the model parameters that control the scores here, and let's say I have the bits, which are parameters controlled by the advertisers, and they basically affect this part of the systems. Now, advertisers don't do that blindly. They do that by observing the clicks and the charges for each of the ad listings. And they can operate at various levels of granularity. Some will reason at the level of each ad, some will use uh, uh, campaign levels, whatever. Anyway. So in order to understand what's happening here, I need to have a model of the advertiser. And of course, there are very ways I can model the advertiser, but there is a way that's canonical because it's the way it's described in the auction theory. It's the rational advertiser. So here is what an advertiser sees. He sees a number of clicks, he sees a total charge, and when, when the advertiser changes the bid, it moves on a curve, which is the pricing curve, that basically if you increase the bid, you're going to get more clicks, but they're going to be more expensive. At the same time, we can assume that the advertiser has a value for the clicks that he doesn't reveal. And what he wants to do is find the spot here where he has the maximum surplus, meaning that the value he gets from the click minus what he pays is as large as possible. That means that the derivative of my pricing curve reveals the value. Now, of course, to do this, you have to transform a problem that's essentially discrete, which is seeing per auctions, into something continuous. And what allows you to do it is precisely uh, uncertainty and randomization. You have a number of uncertainties because uh, advertisers bid on multiple auctions. They differ in time, they differ in users, they differ in scores, and I'm adding randomization on top. And uh, for example, Ate and Nikki Pilov have shown that uh, using appropriate randomization and appropriate uh, uncertainty, you can have a nice equilibrium, and that's okay. So if I want to estimate the value, I can just take the ratios of the derivative of the price with respect to the bid, the derivative of the clicks with respect to the bids. And these are things that I can estimate with my counterfactual derivative estimation procedure. I can get confidence intervals. I can go I get these things. But there are some complications. I cannot randomize the bits because I do not control the bits. But I can randomize the scores. And since the ads are ranked by 
basically products of bits and scores, we can interpret a random score multiplier as a random bid multiplier. You just need to compute a different set of prices. Once I have this, I can write my equilibrium condition, which is the fact that uh, the value I've seen, um, which is the fact basically that uh, advertiser want to maintain this derivative and want it to be unchanged while you're changing the model. I can write this as uh, first order conditions, solve the resulting system, and put it back to obtain how my, let's say, click rate changes with my model parameter in the long run after the reaction of advertisers. So that's the advertiser feedback loop. I could do the same thing for the users, and I can do the same thing for the learning feedback loop. In fact, if I have multiple feedback loops, it's exactly the same procedure. I need to write the total derivative, solve the linear system, substitute into the total derivative. And the technique is simple. It's the same technique as used in physics. So the main message of this is that there is a relation between explore, exploit, and correlation causation. And that using the causation framework, I have a rich and modular toolbox. What I have here is not something that's a learning algorithm. It's something that generates plenty of signals to answer plenty of useful questions for both the people and the algorithms that are running in this organization. Uh, that the differential equilibrium analysis method of physics apply very well. It's not too surprising because classical physics is, a, is, a, is basically a causal, maybe the first causal inference system. And, and finally, um, when I looked at this at the end, I realized that this is a cybernetic viewpoint. This is Wiener all, uh, again. Basically, uh, I'm trying to apply differential methods of physics to a problem that's essentially a propagation of information, except that it's not really Shannon's information. So that's it for now.